I think I had a lot of determination going into the Marine Corps. In many ways, um, people say to me, oh, the Marines made you that way. I said, no, not really. I mean, to some extent they did, but a lot of it I had with me when I, before I went in the Marine Corps. I mean, I grew up, I went to parochial schools, grammar school, high school. I was an altar boy. I used to serve the 7 o'clock mass, getting up early. In the, in the Brothers, we always got up at 5 o'clock in the morning anyway. So the Marine Corps was a, just a way of life for me, and we just fit like hand in glove. My name is David Tierney, United States Marine. When I graduated from high school in St. Mary's in Waltham in 1960, I was straight into the Brothers. I lived under five vows, poverty, chastity, obedience, gratuity, and stability. And we talked a lot of schools here in New England. And that's what I wanted to do, and I joined them, stayed there for three years. I left in 1963. Then I got a letter from the Boston Army base that says, come on in for a physical. I said, what am I getting a physical for? I'm fine. It says, you're being drafted. Drafted? Well, that wasn't in my game plan. My plan at that time, my career plan, was to get a college education, get my degree, and get on with my life in service. Any kind of service was not in my career plan, and that's why I didn't want to have anything to do with it. So then in March 8th, which happens to be my birthday, in 1965, the Marines landed at Da Nang Beach, and that was our official entry, historically our official entry into Vietnam, although we had been there before that. And in order to get people to join the Marines, they said, let's reenact the GI Bill. However, they were going to make a condition on it, that is, you had to serve in a combat zone. So, oh, you go get the GI Bill, you get a college education, Uncle Stam is off my back, I don't go to jail, collect $100, it's a deal. So I went down, what service is most likely to serve in a combat zone? The first to fight, the Marines. So I went into the Marine recruiter down in Waltham and I said, how's the water skiing, the Gulf of Tonkin? He said, it's excellent. I said, what's your shortest enlistment? He said, three years, I'll take it. Well, when I arrived, I arrived 5 to 7, 1967. Little did we know at the time that we literally walked into a hornet's nest. Well, they were going to have a truck convoy put together coming out of Dong Ha, that was our rear, <clears throat> through the Camp Law Refugee Complex going out there. They heard that there was going to be an ambush along the route. So they said, we want you guys, Brunts, 3rd Battalion, 4th Marines, that's who I was with, that was the outfit, to go out there and sweep the road ahead of the convoy and spring the ambush so that they don't walk in or in or Now we got there. Meantime, the Colonel, Colonel, Colonel Christmas, who's out the, the CO at Quezon, is screaming for supplies. He's out, out of ammunition, out of food, he's got medical emergencies, he's got to, you know, get medevac. So no way to get them. So, so he convinced the Motor T captain down in Dongha to release the convoy. He did release the convoy. And just below the foot of Camp J.J. Carroll, which is one of our Marine fire bases there, they annihilated the entire convoy. Every truck, every tank was, was destroyed. They killed or wounded all the Marines. In fact, they were carrying our wounded off with them when we came up the road. So that immediately aborted our mission. We didn't have a mission. Our mission was to take the convoy out there. Now, <laughs> there's no mission. So they said, what are we gonna do? So we'll just stay there on the valley floor, guard that little bridge. The next day, they said, the Colonel said, we're going up the hill because I don't want to be here on the low ground. They didn't know what to do with us. They said, just sit tight until we figure out what we're gonna do with you. So the colonel said to me, he said, I want you to go up the hill and find the snipers. We had snipers attached to us. We didn't know where they were. They were so close among us. I mean, they were in, mixed in even with us, but we couldn't see them. We could hear them, but we couldn't see them. The brush was that thick. So I went up the hill the first time, and it was pr pretty intense fire, and I made it up. And someone said, no, they're not up here. We don't know where they are. So I went back down. They said, well, the colonel said, they're up there somewhere. You go find them. So I went back up the hill, back up, and I'm crawling on my hands and knees. So someone said, well, they're, they're, they're down the hill. So I said, okay, thanks. So I started coming, crawling down the hill, and I got far enough down the hill, I was sort of duck walking down the hill. And suddenly one round landed squarely between my feet. And I knew that that round was intended just for me. That wasn't a stray round. Well, the second round got me. And the first, first impression you have is one of shock. Even though you're in combat all the time and you see this happening all around, you become very blase about it. It's like the weather. And I looked down and my lower leg, my calf muscle, was, was pumping out blood like a, like a water fountain. And from the loss of blood, I started to pass out. I could feel myself passing out. And so I called Corman, Corman. And someone said, we hear you, we hear you, shut up. And these two Marines came out of nowhere, great risk to their own lives, because that was literally a no man's land where I was. And they didn't have to come and get me. But they came out, they said, can you stand up? I said, I don't know. 
They then, with my flak, the armholes in my flak jacket, on their hands and knees, dragged me up the hill to a corner, who gave me a shot of morphine, and, and after that, you feel fine. He took care of my wounds, gave me a blood thickener to, uh, so I just slow down the bleeding, and then we just waited and waited. When they got me on the ship, I got hit, by the way, at 7.30 in the morning. I didn't get on the ship till about 11.30 that night. They, they gave me a spinal, which makes you call free from there down. You don't feel a thing. They gave me something else to put me to sleep. I hadn't eaten all day. I had already lost quite a bit of blood. I was very near death. In fact, the first thing they did with me when they took me out of the field and the first mass unit I went into, there were like four doctors on me. They cut everything off me with scissors and they just wash you all down with betadine. Eventually, I get out to the ship and they started the operation and I went out like a light. And so when they finished the operation, they took me in the gurney down to the casting room, and that's when they put on the plaster. All night long, my leg was cooking. I never knew it. People said, why didn't you feel that? I said, you know what it's like if you had a spinal? If you were a woman, you had a baby, you had a spinal. You don't know you exist from below your waist. So I, so I didn't feel a thing. The three doctors came into my room the next morning to examine what they had done from the operation, and they could smell the burning flesh because it does stink. And he started to unwrap my leg, and he said, you're burnt. I said, no, I'm not burned. I got shot. I didn't get burned. I got shot. So when you burned down, and what he had when he first came into the room, he had this little plastic bottle that he was rattling in his hand. And that, so would you like a souvenir? I took this out of you last night. It was a round that they took out of me. It was an armor piercing round. It was solid steel. So it would go through windshields, uh, helicopters. That's why it's an armor, called armor piercing. And the bullet they took out of me, it, one bullet went in me four times and uh, only exited three times. And uh, <clears throat> It went in below, below my knee, passed between the space between the tibia and the fibula. It just grazed, the tip of the bullet just grazed the, the fibula, which is a little bone back here. Had it hit directly the tibia, the major bone, your shin, it would have just shattered it and they would have amputated my leg below the knee. I was crouched down when they, I knew he was shooting at me. I was crouched down, the bullet then entered my thigh, my inner thigh. Out of there, it went through my scrotum and went up into my rectum. So that's where they took it out of. I still have fragments up there. At the time that I was shot, even when I was on the hospital ship and everything else, I was sort of naive, like a lot of, you know, you played wall when you were kids. You say, bang, bang, try to fix, fix, patch, patch, you're back in the game. And I figured it was going to be that simple. They said, no, you got this, 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 this. You know, you're going back to the States. I have no regrets about anything, about being shot, or about the burning that occurred. It was all an accident. Say, I'm lucky to be alive, I'm happy to be alive. I have no regrets about it, I'm very proud of it. I wouldn't serve with any other service.